So it might not come as a surprise that I am a massive pro wrestling fan, as evidence from my tendency to occasionally slyly stick in references to the medium whenever possible. And if that wasn't obvious enough, I also have my Sami Zayn figure prominently on display in every single one of these videos. What might come as a surprise though to anyone unfamiliar with it is that I can tell you professional wrestling and horror are surprisingly common bedfellows. That might sound incredibly strange to those of you on the outside of this bizarre and brilliant world of stunt work, stage show, and kind of dance performance storytelling, but I promise it's true. To give you a quick crash course, there is an endless list of living dead blood spitting monsters, boogeymen, vampires, chainsaw wielding maniacs, implied serial killers, mischievous evil wizards, burned alive vengeful demons, possessed dolls, slasher villains, creepo snuff film enthusiasts, some kind of orc minotaur thing, and a pretty significant number of psycho clowns that have all somehow as characters within the confines of stories about professional sporting competition made their way into the squared circle for a scrap. And that is honestly just the tip of the iceberg. But if I kept listing horror wrestling gimmicks, I would be here all day. It's not a relationship that always melds well together. For every awesome horror character like Finn Balor's Demon King, there is equally something totally misguided and naff like the Christmas creature, or that time Dustin Rhodes briefly portrayed a floating child snatcher. Yes, it's as bizarre as it sounds. And it's often such a weird marriage of mediums that it isn't always clear what would work and what wouldn't, or why that even might be the case. You just know when you see it sometimes. For example, this group of vampires? Great bunch of vampires. We love these vampires. But these zombies? F them. And you might think that in a world that often seemingly tries, at least to those not in the know, to give the perception of being a legitimate sporting competition, it doesn't by the way, but people think it does, that portraying such an outwardly over the top creation may impede your career by being too unreal and out there. In a world of believable performers, a world often dominated by the muscular and intimidating Brock Lesnar's and Roman Reigns of the world, a spooky little fella might seem a bit out of place and at odds with the product. But actually, a good horror gimmick, when in the hands of the right performer and done well, can catapult you to being a wrestling icon. And I'm willing to bet even if you don't otherwise know a thing about professional wrestling, you probably know this too, because one of the most famous, respected and iconic wrestlers on the planet that everybody in their grand knows is the phenom that is The Undertaker, an undead, teleporting zombie wizard funeral director. But for my money, nobody, not a single soul out of all of the people I've mentioned so far, not even The Undertaker, has been better at melding the worlds of horror and pro wrestling together than one Wyndham Rotunda, also known by his in-ring name of Bray Wyatt. Okay, so, heads up, this is going to be a genuinely very sad one, but my hope is that it could maybe be a beautiful one too. I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of behind the scenes info right now. So first of all, if you're new here, since there's a chance this video because of its subject matter may deviate outside of my usual audience, this is Wholesome Halloween. It's a themed 31 day yearly horror analysis video marathon that is this year running in support of Trans Lifeline. Each year I pick a theme and make a bunch of videos around that theme. And this year's theme is simply a celebration of horror. One I chose specifically because I planned on this being a really big one with it being the third in the trilogy and doing it for charity. And this theme gave me the most wiggle room to do some really out there stuff. Now I'm sorry to say as I was never gonna mention this out of fear of disappointing you all, but obviously I've scaled that back hugely. Some massive stuff came up this year that took up loads of my time and I just couldn't find the hours I really needed to make this month exactly what I wanted it to be. And while I'm still immensely proud of everything out so far and everything still to come and have in fact upped the scope this year in other ways, it's still by and large a film video essay marathon. And I'm letting you all know this because obviously this video is quite a bit different in its subject matter 
and some of you might be confused and questioning why. And the reason why everything else still got cut in favour of films but this random subject of horror in wrestling returned is because, and unfortunately he has the really sad part, in August this year Wyndham Rotunda, also known as the wrestler Bray Wyatt, the subject of this video, tragically and unexpectedly passed away at the age of 36. And knowing that, and knowing that I was doing a celebration of horror, it occurred to me that while the wrestling world was in mourning, it may be that many outside of these circles did not know how much of a loss the horror world had just experienced too. Because I cannot overstate how much of an incredible storyteller this man was. And I really wanted a chance to celebrate that aspect of him, to celebrate how he used the conventions of horror to tell stories in a whole different medium, in a whole different way, and just give people who maybe weren't familiar with his work, a look into one of the greatest character artists of all time. And I need you to understand, this is not me saying that in hindsight now that he has passed. Bray was one of my absolute favourite characters in entertainment, one of my favourite performers and has one of my favourite matches of all time. The man was a genuine visionary and I truly believed him in his life to demonstrate a level of artistic genius, uniqueness and originality most only aspire to. And it sucks so fucking much for so many reasons that he left this world way too soon but even in his cut way too short run as one of the scariest and most compelling figures in the wrestling world, he still leaves behind an incredible legacy of stories and art and craftsmanship that deserves to be celebrated. And so I'd like to try and do that a little now. I'd like to show you all a little bit of why this man was just revolutionary in the world of wrestling and storytelling and horror. And by God, do I not think there are enough words in the world to adequately articulate the unique wonder of the things this guy was doing, and nor will I ever have the skill to truly capture that. But if you'll let me have a try, I'm gonna give it my absolute best shot and just take you through a small sample of some of this dude's body of work and hopefully give a whole bunch of you on the outside of this weird and wonderful world an idea of just truly how special Bray Wyatt was and why this character and his unique brand of horror is worth celebrating. So it all starts with a gimmick. To give those of you completely out of the loop with this stuff some context, gimmicks in wrestling is the base identity of a wrestler's character. Like before they get fleshed out with motivations, backstory, friendships and rivalries, the core gimmick is like the elevator pitch of what this person's shtick is. You know, this guy's an arrogant movie star, this guy's a superhero, this guy's a dinosaur. When Bray Wyatt first came to WWE, the at the time undisputed biggest wrestling brand in the world, under their developmental unit NXT, and for a brief period on their main roster, Wyndham Rotunda was not Bray Wyatt, but rather a character called Husky Harris. A gimmick that I'm not personally massively familiar with as I wasn't watching a lot of his stuff around that time, but that, as far as I can tell, essentially boiled down to Angry Rotund Man. I think Husky Harris has a great look. He's interesting, he's intriguing, but he's fat. Now the thing with gimmicks is there's no one size fits all. A good gimmick can be made bad with the wrong wrestler match to it, and wrestlers with bad gimmicks can absolutely elevate them into something spectacular with how much they develop it. It can be a bit of an ongoing conversation. Some wrestlers have a lot more control of who they present as and what they're all about. For some it's more of a back and forth discussion and pitching with those in charge of creative. And sometimes for others it's just management going, hey, uh, you guys are like, I don't know, church singers now? Do with that what you can. In the case of Wyndham Rotunda, his character Bray Wyatt came about, as he explained on a podcast with veteran wrestler Stone Cold, basically from the threat of being fired. The Husky Harris gimmick wasn't something Wyndham himself came up with, having later even commented while portraying his newer character that the Husky Harris period destroyed him. And it wasn't working for WWE either, who pulled him to the side and told him he had to change his act or he wouldn't be needed anymore. So Wyndham pitched Bray Wyatt and oh my god caught absolute lightning in a bottle. Bray Wyatt, as he first appeared, 
was the leader of a swamp-dwelling cult known as the Wyatt family. It's exactly the kind of gimmick that on paper could go either way. But Wyndham, who I'm from here on out mostly just going to call by his stage name, brought a level of horror and magic to this character that absolutely nobody could have matched. Taking inspiration from multiple sources, Wyatt was this concoction of a previous wrestling persona mashed up with various horror influences. It had just so happened that on the same day Husky Harris had been told to change or leave, a former wrestler called Dan Spivy, who had wrestled very briefly under a character he developed called Whale and Mercy, just so happened to be in the performance center where the current wrestlers train and the two got into a discussion. Whale and Mercy was a character inspired by Robert De Niro's terrifying performance as Max Cady in Martin Scorsese's remake of Cape Fear. Much like Max Cady, Whalen was a tattooed, jet black haired, Hawaiian shirt wearing sinister man. Though outside of the ring, Spivy had the guise of a gentleman with a soft spoken southern drawl. He wrestled like an animal out to hurt and punish rather than a competitor, only to return to his gentlemanly pretense when the end bell rang. Spivy's run as this character was cut short by an early retirement due to injuries, but he gave Husky Harris his blessing to adopt the character and build further on it, and even helped Harris initially develop his own take on these elements, and thus Bray Wyatt was born, a creation that took the foundations of what Spivy had previously built and ran with it to impossible new heights. Bray Wyatt kept the Max Cady touches, like the shirt and the southern drawl, but added so much more. As the character developed, he became the leader of the aforementioned Swamp Residing Cult, and pulled from inspirations such as Rob Zombie movies and actual cult leaders like Charles Manson and David Koresh to develop his presence, appearance, and manner of speaking. He grew out his beard and his hair to make him look more wild and unkempt. Everything from the way he walked, the rocking chair he frequently occupied, the lantern he carried. It all painted a picture of this enigmatic, dangerous stranger who would approach with a friendly southern hospitality and charismatic yet mysterious wisdom, but who could turn violent on a dime. His whole presentation and the presentation of his backwoods sheep mask wearing cult the Wyatt family, which initially included himself and two massive bearded monsters of a man in fellow wrestlers Eric Rowan and Luke Harper, a character portrayed by Jonathan Huber, who also tragically passed away before his time in 2020 due to lung issues, was carried out fully in the aesthetic styling of Southern Gothic horror, paired with the kind of dirty, grimy costuming and visuals of something like House of a Thousand Corpses or The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Video packages of the family would play throughout the show where Bray would spout monologues from their dilapidated and decayed compound that basically amounted to quasi-religious sermons where he'd describe himself as the Eater of Worlds, terminology borrowed from Stephen King's novel, It. It was an incredibly unique presentation, mishmashing a wide range of horror and real life influences into a totally unique creation, the likes of which felt like nothing WWE had ever seen before. Amongst all the John Cena's and Randy Orton's of the world, Bray Wyatt and his family felt like outsiders, like invaders, like dangerous lunatics swarming into a world they didn't belong to. And key to it all, was Wyndham himself. Promos are the parts of the show where a wrestler speaks to sell their upcoming matches, their story, their character. It's not enough in this world to just be a good wrestler. You have to be an interesting person too. This is where promos come in. Not every wrestler writes their own stuff, but Wyndham did. And it turns out, the dude was an absolute poet. Stick a microphone in his hands, this character in his heart, and fill his head with the words he crafted, and this man was entrancing. When Husky Harris was in developmental, he would often perform well in physical challenges, but fall short in tasks that required him in a speaking role. There was an unnatural delivery in his words, a lack of believability in his character. You never got a sense of who this person was, but with Bray Wyatt, Wyndham became Bray Wyatt. If you have never had the privilege of sitting through a Bray Wyatt promo, even if you are not a wrestling fan, I encourage you to seek one out. The man worked the mic like an artist. No matter how ridiculous the concept of this hillbilly cult wrestling family was, or how abstract the words that poured from his lips could be, you believed every single sentence. There was no character to be seen here. This was Bray, a soft-spoken secret psychopath who spouted a kind of broken insight that felt like the merging of the ramblings of a deranged serial killer with the musings of a Greek philosopher, delivered with the cadence of a religious preacher. And he said it all with an 
effortless confidence, often while casually and slowly rocking in his chair as he pair expressions of manic wonder with violent intent. It was a complete breath of fresh air. He was, in his own words, the colour red in a world full of black and white. His promos dripped with subtext and lore, like allusions to his mysterious sister Abigail, his childhood, his possible future opponents. They existed not as simple cries of, I'm going to fight this person, but as puzzles and riddles to be dissected and analysed, speeches that rewarded those paying attention with a little bit more insight into this enigmatic character and his place in this world. Every time he spoke, he had the audience in the palm of his hand, hanging onto every word. Hell, he had the whole world in his hands, a sentiment the many crowds he performed in front of would agree with as they'd sing this in tribute to him. It was easy to believe in Wyatt as an appealing cult leader, because when he spoke, you listened. There was a frightening wisdom to his words. Unlike others, he didn't need to shout to get his point across, perceiving himself as not just a man, but the nagging conscience of a world that had thrown itself away to moral monsters. He'd lull you into his promos with his gentle, soft-spoken accent and carefully placed smiles as he'd wax lyrically on all the ills he perceived to plague the WWE, ills he and his Wyatt family sought to correct. And in attempting to correct them, they would enter the ring where Bray would continue to develop his persona through one of the most incredible entrances you'd ever witness. Welcome to the performance by a sudden chaotic flash of horror imagery, the harsh shrill tones of out of tune instruments, and a quick cut short yell from Bray himself. The family would enter slowly to the song Live in Fear, a haunting track with an ethereal sounding female vocalist. And as the stadiums and arenas would darken for their presence, they'd light their path with the old gas lantern Bray would always carry with him and blow out before disappearing into darkness. It was striking, but perhaps the most special part of this entrance was Bray's Fireflies. Another reason Bray's cult leader persona worked so well is because he was good at being one. Through nothing but the strength of his speech and his raw charisma, he recruited us, the audience, into his movement. And now, wherever his entrance was made, entire stadiums and arenas would fill with the sparkles of the crowd's individual phone lights. Bray called us his fireflies, and the spectacle of witnessing tens of thousands of them fill the sky around Bray was an awe-inspiring visual, one that told the story of the man's control over people far more than any script could. In Ring, he was just as monstrous, a commanding presence who often had complete control over the match, whether fighting alone, ordering his cult around, or taking leadership over whoever he was partnered with. Bray could, in his dominant efforts, feel like a puppet master manipulating others in the match with violence and mind games, often finishing his opponents off with the image of him stretched out into a manic upside down crab position before finally delivering the last blow with his finishing move, the sister Abigail. A delicate kiss to the forehead followed by an aggressive face slam into the mat that perfectly encapsulated the gentle and violent juxtaposition of his whole persona. He was an incredible villain with an unparalleled presence. And though it may seem silly to suggest that a wrestling performance had the capacity to scare, just look at the reaction of this kid upon his approach. Bray had a presence. He was a character like no other. And I need you to understand the level of skill it takes to craft something like this. To be a wrestler and manifest a creation at this high a level takes such a combination of wildly different talents. It's public speaking, it's stunt work, it's writing, it's stage performance, it's working a crowd, it's acting, it's improv, it's dance, it's gymnastics, it's strength conditioning, it's cardio, it's communication, and it's all that before it's even wrestling. And Bray? is doing all of that together. He's one of the guys who initially created this character. He's the one developing him and writing him and then going out and performing as him. And he does this almost every week, often multiple times a week, having to come up with new material that fits around WWE's booking and long-term plans for other stars, all between constantly traveling to different cities, sometimes different countries. And he does this 
for years. And through these years, with this character, Bray would tell a variety of fantastic stories. He would attempt to be the corrupting force that destroyed WWE's biggest clean-cut babyface superstar John Cena. He would take his family and put the first crack in the armour of the previously unbeatable and dominant S.H.I.E.L.D. faction. He'd expand his cult with more muscle and eventually take top superstar Randy Orton under their wing, causing rifts with his original members. And he would even fight off top stars in Cena, AJ Styles, The Miz, Dean Ambrose and Baron Corbin inside of a huge destructive metal cage known as the Elimination Chamber to take home one of the highest honours in wrestling, the WWE Championship. A prize he would drop to his knees holding as the light of thousands of fireflies danced to his glory in celebration. There are too many stories too many moments in his incredible career as this backwoods swamp dweller to pick from. Not everything he tried always worked and he was often victim of poor booking or creative hand tying from management that would stifle his momentum. According to Matt Hardy who along with Wyatt had a brief but incredible feud that developed into them having a run with the tag team championships, they were actually taken off TV at one point because WWE got sick of hearing them both pitch ideas for their characters. Just to give you an insight into some of his troubles there. But even even with these obstacles and occasional misfires, he was always taking risks, always trying new things. And in the world of professional wrestling, originality is a rare and special commodity. And when Bray Wyatt worked, there was nothing in the world like him. One particular story I want to tell you all, just to give you an idea of how incredible he was, isn't even really his story, but rather about the role he played in someone else's. This guy, is Daniel Bryan, a plucky smiling hippie of a man who despite not looking like the prototypical wrestler, won over legions of fans with his raw passion and by somehow being an absolute demon and one of the single greatest performers at in-ring competition in the world. The guy is a wrestling machine. Problem is, he didn't look like one. And though through skill alone he should have been catapulted to superstardom, the WWE wanted someone who looked good on posters and lunchboxes to be the face of their company. Though after an encounter with Bray Wyatt, it became even clearer that Daniel Bryan's star power was undeniable, and the incident would mark one of the major moments along a path that led to a course correction which resulted in him becoming one of the biggest stars on the planet. Bryan, by this point already a fan favourite, found himself in the crosshairs of Bray and his family, Bray having become determined to have him join their ranks, something they would achieve by beating and tormenting him into submission, even putting him through a three-on-one handicap match until eventually Brian realised that no matter how hard he fought, the family would just continue their torment until he was grinded down into submission and he eventually relented. He'd reluctantly joined the family in a move that initially was pretty unpopular with fans who wanted him instead to pursue the story of chasing the main prize of the top title, but it would prove to be a blessing in disguise. After serving with the family for weeks, Brian, now donning the kind of boiler suit garb that made him visually fit right in with his new hillbilly horror friends, would team up with Wyatt to fight another tag team known as the Usos in a cage match. It wasn't so much the match itself that was monumental, but rather the story the two told afterwards that gave the show one of its most iconic endings to an episode. Coming to a losing effort against the Usos, the abusive Wyatt expressed disappointment in his new underling and demanded he offer himself up for punishment, which a subservient Brian agreed to by falling to his knees. Bray would pick Brian up and set him up for his finishing move, the Sister Abigail, only for Brian to unexpectedly push him away in a show of resistance, and the crowd immediately erupted. Bray went manic. He began screaming at Brian, his eyes wide with fury, but Brian stood resilient as the crowd threw nothing short of utter worship at his newfound defiance. Bray would antagonise Brian, dropping to his knees and daring him to find the courage to attack. Brian stood silent as Bray returned to his feet, belittling and screaming, that's what I thought, you're a coward, you're a coward, before attempting to strike. His attack would backfire though as Brian dodged and subjected to Bray to a relentless flurry of sharp kicks in response. As Bray lay dormant, Brian stripped himself of the uniform the family had forced upon him, and as Bray's cult members attempted to invade the cage, Brian, with a newfound confidence, would fight them off too, using their own leader to knock them from the steel, and then pure magic 
What happened next was the complete and utter synergy of crowd and performer. As Brian hyped up the audience with his signature taunt before delivering a swift finishing knee to Bray's face, before then climbing to the top of the cage that had just moments ago been the physical embodiment of the prison of his subservience as thousands of fans joined him in total sync in his display of victory. Their chance of yes with each hand raised the rallying victory cry that kept going as the episode faded to black. It was a goosebumps generating moment for our star of the night who would go on to become the star of the year. But a key ingredient in its recipe was the antagonist he had to foil. The achievement only felt so monumental because he had broken free of the grasp of such a sinister, abusive and dominating figure. A great hero needs a great villain. And for Daniel Bryan, even for what was a very short story by the standards of wrestling, Bray was that villain in spades. In that moment, Wyatt existed as the dragon and Brian the dragon slayer. It was the final girl versus the hulking slasher, the moment where the sole survivor stands tall and the monster crawls back into its hole. Bray had cultivated a horror character, one whose image had been surrounded with horror aesthetics, everything from creepy sheep masks to found footage to decayed buildings and wide-eyed stairs. And in doing so, he became someone who could be the monster in a story. And in this story, his role was to do the thing I love most about horror. Teach us that no matter how dark things get, the monsters can be beaten. And the thing is, at least just in terms of pure horror, this wasn't even his most accomplished character. Not by a long shot. We're really glad that you're our friend And this is a friendship that'll never ever end So it's 2019 and after disbanding from his tag team with Matt Hardy, Wyatt had been off TV for a little while. Fans speculated on and clamoured for him coming back and they got their wish. But when he returned, he was very different. <laughs> Did you miss me? Oh, how I have missed you. Gone was the unkempt beard and hair, the Hawaiian shirts, the rocking chair, the southern drawl, everything that made Bray, well, Bray. Now, in a seemingly completely bizarre turn of events, Bray was suddenly a jovial and upbeat Mr. Rogers style children's presenter with a cheesy new catchphrase of Yowie Wowie, who would randomly interrupt the normal wrestling show with little segments of his children's program, The Firefly Funhouse. A jarring departure from not only the Bray we previously knew, but also for WWE in general, with each episode of The Funhouse feeling like someone just accidentally sat on the remote and switched the channel to PBS Kids in the middle of the action. But obviously, in true Bray fashion, there was far more depth to this than initially met the eye. Even from the first episode, something about the children's show we were witnessing was off. It was less Sesame Street and more seemed to take inspiration from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. The puppet companions Bray kept during these segments, which would in this kind of scenario traditionally be something cute to appeal to their young target audience, had creepy and unsettling designs that would be more likely to give a child nightmares. The laugh tracks and cheers and boos from the children off screen were a little too canned and a little too regular, giving the whole thing an uncanny almost Lynchian quality. There were brief moments where the facade of the jolly presenter character would disappear and something sinister seemed to be lurking behind the cheery persona. And inappropriate things would happen throughout. Like in the first episode, Bray refers to his old persona as a pathetic slob loser. And after seemingly listening to his hand talk to him, a hand which strangely wore a glove labeled hurt, pulled out a chainsaw and decapitated a cardboard cutout of that previous character before saying goodbye. It was baffling, it was weird, but it was compelling. Much like Wyatt's previous promos in his cult leader era, these segments became something to analyse, feeding us little nuggets of what might be going on and giving us some insight into Bray's psychology. Fans were quick to point out that the puppet, Mercy the Buzzard, was likely a homage to Waylon Mercy, who had initially helped Bray on his Max Cady gimmick. And the doll, Abby the Witch, was an allusion to the still mysterious sister Abigail that was part of Wyatt's previous law. Week by week, these segments would continue to interrupt the show, introducing new puppet characters like Huskus, an overweight, food-obsessed pig who always had the remnants 
of chocolate around his mouth, and Rambling Rabbit, a high-pitched rabbit that called everyone dude and would often be the victim of other characters' torment, on occasion even being killed before coming back for the next episode. And there was even a puppet depicting his actual real-life boss Vince McMahon, an evil puppet that was in this world a literal devil figure with horns. All of these things further pieces in a strange puzzle that together built up a complex portrait of an unusual broken man, with possible nods to the performer Wyndham's actual feelings with regards to his body of work and some of his insecurities around it. Rambling Rabbit was thought to be an acknowledgement of the criticism Bray's promos would sometimes receive for being too rambling and going nowhere. Mercy the Buzzard at one point killing the rabbit for, as he puts it, trying to force him to adhere to his bohemian worldview and ideologies. A somewhat defining trait of Bray's cult leader gimmick. Huskis the Pig was an obvious nod to his time as Husky Harris, here depicted with his only defining personality trait being that he is an overweight slob, one that the Vince puppet threatens to fire, something we now know almost actually happened to the real Husky Harris character. The most compelling thing though in these segments was Bray himself, or to be even more specific, the Bray that the presenter was trying to keep buried behind the smiles that would often bubble to the surface. At the end of each episode, Wyatt would sign off by saying, remember my fireflies, as always, I'll light the way, all you have to do is let me in. Let me in became a repeated mantra throughout the show, and unlike the rest of the phrase, it was always said with a serious edge to it, as Bray would stare down into the camera with its delivery. Each time it was said, it would be delivered in a more sinister manner than the last and slowly but surely, the segments became more and more unhinged and bizarre, until eventually, well, we let him in. <laughs> the Fiend, Bray Wyatt's dark secret, a supernatural and evil alter ego that seemingly lurked deep within the happy-go-lucky kids presenter that Wyatt had returned as. The strange Firefly Funhouse segments being a kind of surreal prison, half in and half out of reality which contained him. If each of the puppets of the Funhouse were a compartmentalization of the different aspects of Bray's personality, then the fiend was his darkness, the id to his super ego. This aspect of the character was alluded to week after week, a slow drip of information fed to us, clues building on top of one another to give an idea of what we were dealing with. But even after his reveal, the fiend was shrouded in mystery. Where had he come from? What was he capable of? And most importantly, was he going to wrestle? Because yes, let me remind you, all of the stuff Bray was doing here was in service of a professional wrestling show. Wrestling is really cool and fun, my dudes. Fans would get the answer to at least one of these questions at SummerSlam 2019, when another wrestler, Finn Balor, made the mistake of calling him out. And for the first time, the world was introduced to The Fiend live and in the flesh. And my God, Finn stands in the ring awaiting his opponent, only to be greeted with the cheesy jingle of the Firefly Funhouse theme. But the sound distorts, the image burns out and the arena begins to power down into darkness. As sections of the scene fall into black, a word painted in blood hovers on a gigantic screen, changing each time more of the building's power falls. Let him in. Total darkness. And then a hazy light through some smoke. Bray has returned with his lantern, it seems. But oh god, that's not a lantern. The fiend emerges through the smoke, lighting his way with the contorted, severed head of his past persona, its mouth stretched into an eternal scream and hollowed out to be used as a light source. The eyes of the head have been sewn shut and its matted hair tied upwards into a knotted candle so it can be lifted. The fiend himself is this hooded figure that looks like a serial killer with piercing yellow eyes, skinned the face of an evil clown and stretched it out over his own. The music that welcomes him into the arena is a terrifyingly chaotic version of his original theme, now punctuated with screaming lyrics, bellows of the words hurt and heal, and apologies followed by demands of let me in. 
Horror characters had existed in wrestling before, but this, this was like nothing anyone had ever seen. The horror vibes had never been this overt. I still can't believe he got away with that lantern on an all ages show. And these concepts and designs were 100% Wyndham's own ideas too. Something he closely worked on with the legendary Tom Savini Studios, who under horror filmmaking icon Tom Savini, whose work you would recognize from, I don't know, almost any horror film that came out from the entire 80s decade and a lot of stuff beyond that helped bring Wyndham's puppets, masks and props to life, culminating in the perfect execution of this incredible character, who now stood in a ring in front of tens of thousands of fans who couldn't believe what they were seeing. And when the match started, this terrifying figure made his mark on the wrestling world by absolutely dominating Finn Balor, a high profile and usually competitive fighter in a manner of minutes. Not just pinning him, but annihilating him with a fence that didn't seem to just want to defeat the man, but incapacitate him. Choke slams and neck snaps and throat based attacks that sent Finn into unconsciousness before the fiend looked straight down the camera and then just disappeared. For the character's first appearance in front of a live crowd, it was a career defining moment, one that instantly enamored its entire audience and immediately made Bray Wyatt and The Fiend one of the most captivating and electric acts in wrestling. Much like with his cult leader gimmick, Wyatt would go on to develop further interesting stories using this character after his debut. He would destroy industry legends in Mick Foley and Kane. He would corrupt female star Alexa Bliss into a twisted, sinister version of her Herself as she became his partner in crime with her own strangely switching personality and a creepy doll companion. He would revisit an old rivalry with the man he once tried to recruit in Daniel Bryan. He would absolutely destroy Seth Rollins to once more acquire the top championship, something The Fiend would once again, through the help of Savini Studios, put his own personal touch upon. But almost undoubtedly, at least in my opinion, the greatest achievement with this character came in one of my favorite WrestleMania matches of all time, his Firefly Funhouse match with John Cena. So a bit of context on this one. Back in 2014 at WrestleMania 30, while still running his cult leader persona, Bray Wyatt, the character, experienced his biggest ever failure, setting himself on a quest to corrupt the incorruptible. He came face to face with one of WWE's biggest stars and perpetual good guy, John Cena. The entire narrative of their rivalry and Mania match focusing around Bray trying to show the world that Cena was not only not an undefeatable superhuman, but that he was as fallible a person as anyone else, just as capable of giving in to the darkness in us all. Throughout the match, Bray would compel Cena into trying to take the low road and cheat to win. But unfortunately for Bray, and to be honest, unfortunately for Wyndham's momentum as a star at this point in his career, Cena would not have to stoop to an uncharacteristic level to defeat Wyatt. Fast forward to 2020 and Cena is back, declaring that he would take a back seat at this year's WrestleMania and allow new talent to shine outside of the confines of his massive shadow. This bothered Bray, who even in his friendly Firefly Funhouse form expressed a frustration at this sentiment. Let the young talent shine. Let them raise their profiles. What? Like he had done for Bray back at WrestleMania 30. Wyatt would cut promos reflecting on his past with Cena, confessing to the pain that he had went through following that loss. How everything wrong in his life, how all of the missed opportunities, all of the lack of direction, all of his problems that followed, it could all be traced back to this moment. A moment that was supposed to make Bray a star. The moment that should have launched him into the success he had crawled through every hardship so far to attain, but instead almost destroyed his career. Bray resented Cena for what he had done to him. He felt the result had been some sort of cosmic mistake made by an uncaring universe. A mistake he now seek to correct. Cena accepted his challenge and the two would carry a program back and forth before their big fight, discussing their past together and how each of them planned to come out on top. And in his last promo before the show, it seemed like Wyatt had got under Cena's skin with his promise to right that wrong as he cut a promo on Wyatt that was uncharacteristically mean-spirited and venomous. Michael Cole, this ain't gonna be a WrestleMania match to steal the show. It's gonna be physical, it is going to be gruesome, and it is going to be uncomfortable to watch. But this WrestleMania match is gonna accomplish what should have happened six years ago. Ending the existence of the most overhyped, 
overvalued, overprivileged WWE superstar in existence. And then the night of the match came, a special Firefly Funhouse match, which at the time, absolutely no one knew what that meant. And what it ended up being, absolutely nobody could have expected. Okay, so I need you to understand before I get into this, that no, we wrestling fans do not think wrestling is real. It makes no pretense to be real. Going to a wrestling show and rolling your eyes at how fake things are is like going to a magic show with a date and trying to impress her by saying, you know he's not really a wizard, right? We know. Wrestling is a scripted stunt show performance where I will say the word fake isn't entirely correct either, as these people really do get hurt and fall and bleed and crash into things. But we understand it is not a legitimate sports competition. It is a storytelling medium within which experiments can be taken by the performers to, within the confines of a show that is narratively a sports competition, the same way a tournament arc in an anime would be, new and interesting stories can be created in which characters clash in an effort to fight for fame, values, respect, revenge, whatever sort of reason. And because this is what it is, it is a malleable form of entertainment from which different genres can be pulled. Bray Wyatt is someone that wholly understood the form's malleability, constantly experimenting and testing the limits of the format by incorporating all kinds of external inspirations and new ideas into the medium. A medium that includes all sorts of genres and subgenres. There's comedy wrestling, there's technical wrestling, there's high spots wrestling, and then there's even something like the Firefly Funhouse. Match. This match, which took place at a time when crowds could not be present at WWE shows due to the lockdown, took on the form not of your average standard wrestling match, but of a Lynchian-esque psychological horror comedy where Bray fought Cena not within the confines of the famous squared circle, but rather within the abstractions of his past, his potential diverging paths, and his insecurities. It was a bizarre fever dream in which Cena was made to relive the greatest failures of his career, forced to confront things things like how his star power kept young talent down, his role in perpetuating a certain body type within the industry. He was even taunted with references to his real life recent split from his ex fiance Bray dragged Cena through a personal hell of torment, all taking place in a kind of surreal examination of wrestling history that used that history as a framing device to further explore and break down his character and his role within it. I simply cannot do justice to how wildly unique this thing was. This single match from Bray's career could be a video all of its own and as long as this one is, and I still probably wouldn't scratch the surface of everything going on here. Eventually the match culminates in Cena's defeat, Bray having even taken them back to the moment of their previous clash in which Cena's superheroic babyface persona had villainously crippled Wyatt's career, showing him to be the real heel in this story all along. Exposed and emotionally broken, Cena falls victim to the Fiend, and as the Fiend holds Cena in defeat, Cena's own words come back to haunt him. This WrestleMania match is going to accomplish what should have happened six years ago, ending the existence of the most overhyped, overvalued, overprivileged WWE superstar in existence. Cena is exposed and beaten, and The Fiend and Bray stand triumphant, having righted his wrongs. This was a wrestling match. A psychological horror comedy wrestling match. Nobody, absolutely nobody, was doing things like Bray was. Unfortunately, there were times when he proved a little too creative for WWE's tastes, who often didn't know what to do with him. After The Fiend received initial strong booking as an unstoppable monster, his career as the character eventually fell into credibility killing losses and confusing match endings and rivalries that ruined his mystique. And eventually, in a move I am genuinely still so mad about, WWE made the decision to release Wyatt during a period of budget cuts back in 2021, too much fan backlash. The separation thankfully didn't last too long though, and next year, in 2022, after a series of mysterious vignettes with a traditional Wyatt-esque surrealness to them aired throughout WWE programming, often hidden as easter eggs throughout the show that were buried behind QR codes fans would have to find in order to reveal clues, the Extreme Rules pay-per-view show concluded with the return of Bray, and once again, he knew how to make an entrance. The show is over, 
but the lights go out. The audience's cue to bring out their fireflies. The camera pans wildly through the dancing lights in the crowd, where stationed at random points lurk the firefly funhouse puppets. Only now, they aren't puppets, but fully grown figures in twisted costumes. Each is revealed by a spotlight one by one, along with a person in a fiend mask. Bray is coming. We are shown the Firefly Funhouse once more, but no longer is it the colourful world it once was, but a dark, abandoned, decayed wreck of its former self. Its contents and the puppets who inhabit it covered in layers of dust and cobwebs. A masked figure appears in the static of an old TV. Its voice is distorted as it asks, who killed the world, before asserting, you did. And back in the arena sits a door, a small wooden door under dancing lights. It crashes open, spilling out smoke and blue light, and from its smoke emerges a lantern. A figure walks out carrying the lantern. He wears the mask from the TV screen. He stands in front of the awed crowd, and in the blue ethereal light of the lantern, he unmasks to rapturous applause as he reveals himself to definitively be the returning Bray Wyatt. Blowing out his lantern, the show cuts to black. We would have to wait for Bray to speak, wait for him to reveal what incredible character he was bringing to us this time. But when we'd next hear from Bray, he had returned as himself. It wasn't Bray who spoke the first time Wyatt stepped back into the ring, but an emotional, nervous, and soul-bearingly honest Wyndham. It's a truly beautiful and heartfelt monologue in which Wyndham, not Bray Wyatt, on the verge of tears, reflects on his fraught past year, a year where he lost his job, lost his dream, lost his friends. He confides in us his mental health issues, something it had been reported that he had been struggling with throughout his career. And he tells us how much our love for him had pulled him back. I really, truly recommend you seek this out because, oh my God, it's incredible. It's an artist just bearing his soul voicing and then putting to rest all those insecure thoughts at the back of his head that told him his creations, his efforts, the things we all loved him for, didn't matter. And hearing someone as successful and creative as him have the same issues in his head that I think every person who has ever suffered bad mental health or pursued a creative endeavor and been disappointed in themselves has had. Hearing him, of all people, openly voice how much he suffered with these feelings genuinely probably made a lot of people that day feel a lot less alone in the world. I know I felt something from it all. And though the promo would end with a tease for his stories to come, introducing us to a new creation of his, a mysterious character known as Uncle Howdy, everything that came before that was the honest feelings of a man who had lost everything he'd ever dreamed of, fell into a hole of despair, and been dragged back out of it by the people that loved him. Now, I would love to tell you how the Uncle Howdy arc of Bray's career developed and concluded. I would love to tell you what became of the teased Wyatt Six. I would love to tell you all of the stories that Bray himself would have loved to tell you. But unfortunately, I can't. Because tragically, this would be Bray Wyatt's final run in the wrestling world and it would be cut short by the passing of the man that played him and that uh, that just fucking sucks it's just deeply deeply unfair and wrong and it sucks i know i didn't know bray wyatt or wyndham even personally i've seen him live but i've never even so much as met the guy at a fan signing those who have though both in life and in death have nothing but positive things to say about him by all accounts on top of being an incredible talent and creative genius he was also a complete sweetheart and a loving father too i am not going to profess to know that side of him whatsoever but i am still absolutely fucking devastated by his loss I know some people think it's gauche or tacky to mourn a celebrity you never personally knew, but while I don't subscribe to that opinion anyway, you have to understand that with wrestling, a loss of a star in that world is so different to anywhere else. I don't say this to be callous to other industries and professions. Any loss of life 
is a tragedy. When an actor or a singer or a dancer or anyone you follow and appreciate the work of passes away, especially at such a young age, it's a terrible feeling. And even isolated from your personal feelings of losing an artist you love, it's also someone's friend or family member. And regardless of the fame, that alone is a tremendous loss. But what those of you outside of the wrestling bubble maybe don't recognize is how much some of those negative feelings are magnified when it's a wrestler. Because this massive yet still kind of weirdly niche and tightly knit world is so massively interconnected and that whole world mourns at once. If an actor dies, it's obviously a tragedy, but not every other actor in the world is going to necessarily have co-starred in a film with them or be familiar with their work. Not every dancer knows every other dancer. Not every football fan knows the names of every major player on every team. But I promise you, as someone invested in these circles, the entire wrestling world knew Bray Wyatt. Every single wrestler from the top level to the bottom in every single promotion and every single fan in every single country who'd ever enjoyed an episode of SmackDown or Raw since his debut knew exactly who Bray Wyatt was. They may have grew up with Bray Wyatt. They may have been colleagues with Bray Wyatt. They may have wrestled with Bray Wyatt. Once you hit that level that Bray Wyatt did, you are not just some people's favorite character in this world. You are universal. And the collective heartbreak at the passing of a guy like that is a heartbreak so loud we all hear it. And you have to understand it's a whole different world. You might love an actor or a musician or a skateboarder or whatever. And I'd never take that away from you. There's certainly plenty of high profile figures outside of the wrestling world, which I know their passing would be extremely upsetting for me. But I don't watch a new movie with those actors in every single week that also stars every other actor I love and they're all friends who travel together behind the scenes. I don't see a musician in person who releases a new song every Friday night and learn about their career as I watch it grow in real time alongside me. There's no skateboarder I'm ever gonna tune in to watch and spend some time with twice weekly for a whole decade of my life. But you do that with rest. Bray, for a lot of people, was a constant in their life. Someone who grew as they did. Someone they maybe saw in person multiple times. Who they maybe saw more than some close friends and family members. We watched his story develop. Some of us for years and years and years of our life. And we were also part of that story. Wrestling is such unique unreality where fictional people occupy a real world space that we the audience become characters within its narrative. We are spoken to directly. We can change characters' fates with our input. We are part of the program. With Bray, we were literally members of the family he created. We were his fireflies. We helped light his way to his greatest triumphs. And like he said in his return promo, we brought him back. And God, I wish we could do that again. But we can't. So instead, this whole world mourns. A world so connected that rival companies pause to pay tribute, where competitors to WWE told their roster they could have the day off to pay their respects. Where every promotion, small or large, found time to memorialize this man. Where WWE's biggest competition, AEW, a company that has never signed Bray, that Bray has never appeared in or worked for in any capacity, that for all intents and purposes has nothing to do with Bray whatsoever, had over 80,000 fans filling Wembley Arena light up the sky with fireflies in a show of respect to a man who never even wrestled there. The loss of Bray is monumental. It's a tragedy not just for the loss of life, not just for the loss of a character, not just for the loss of a wrestling icon and a horror icon, not just for the loss of an artist, but also for the loss of an art itself. I cannot overstate how much nobody was doing wrestling like Bray did. You look at something like the Firefly Funhouse match and we will simply never get anything like that in this medium ever again. Cinematic matches exist outside of it, but none of them like this. This was something only he was doing, only he could do, a type of wrestling that no one else was capable of imagining and executing. Just imagine for a moment if Vincent van Gogh died and then there were no more paintings. That in art form simply 
ceased to continue with the passing of one of its most celebrated figures. No new paintings could ever be made and the world was left only with the work he left behind and no more to come. Wrestling is not the art. It is the art form. It is the blank canvas upon which art is made. And only Bray Wyatt knew how to paint red in a world of black and white. Though I'm sure he inspired millions and years from now, someone may take up that mantle and work his craft again. Right now, it feels like we'll never see his particular shade of red again. This is why I felt like I needed to make this episode because I cannot overstate how big his loss is and I need people outside of these circles to understand what's gone from this world now. What a unique brand of horror and wrestling that we will never see again. And I may not know the man, but I know how he made me feel. How his creativity genuinely inspired me each and every week. When I was playing around with writing a visual novel, I put a character in based on him. When my musician friend asked me if I had any interesting voices to sample from TV or films to set the tone for a new track, I got her to sample him in her music. When I saw his final return promo, he put into perspective for me a lot of anxieties and fears around failure that I personally felt and I thought, if Bray, of all people, can feel like his stuff doesn't matter sometimes and it means so much to me, then maybe the stuff I create that I don't think matters could matter too. Bray was special. Bray was an inspiration. Bray was an incredible and unique voice and artist. And I just need people to know that. So we're not going to do our usual sign off today. Instead, I'm just going to ask that wherever you are in the world, maybe throw up a firefly for Bray, for Wyndham. Let the lights all over the world thank him for everything he did. Let him know it meant something. Rest in peace, man. I thought that everything that I'd ever done here or otherwise, I thought it was all meaningless. Nothing I ever did has mattered to anyone. We got the lights, house lights, please. Yeah, 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 I just, uh, that's right. I'm so serious, fireflies, man. The last time I was in a strap match, it was against somebody I loved. Somebody I loved! He's a creative genius who brought us all the amazing gift of Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt and I, we went through hell. That guy did everything imaginable to me, and I did everything that I could back to him. And through that, you know what he was doing? He was getting me ready for anything. We all loved him. We all really loved him, and we'll all really, really, really miss him. And, and I, was, I, I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs>